Welcome to another Known Experience podcast. Today, Sean and I are here with Kevin McAvoy, who's coming to us from his artist studio in Long Island. Uh, Kevin has a fascinating history and experience in the arts. Uh, he was trained in New York City, in Florence, Italy, under some of the best fine art teachers in the world. He has done portraits for jazz museums. He has painted uh, for a project that raised over a million dollars to save African rhinos, which we'll hear about later. Uh, but Kevin and Sean met on a trip to Africa, and I think that's the best way to start our story. Kevin, welcome to the podcast, and uh, why don't you tell us the story of how you and Sean met? Yeah, it's good to be here, and I'm a big fan of the podcast, and uh, yeah, jumping into the story of meeting Sean and just that whole experience. Uh, I'm in the middle of Uganda. I'm really excited about the the work that we're about to undertake and I found out that I was in the midst of like all like early 20 somethings which is great I mean they're so fun but I did feel a little bit alone in a certain sense <laughs> yeah. uh, just because I went there with my son who's 15 years old and he's now six foot tall he's as tall as me but I just felt like worlds apart in a certain sense and out of a group of like 20 something people like it's like oh it would that's it I just felt a little bit alone and then Sean rolls up and he just has some of the war stories that are exact parallels to the weird life that I've had as an artist and I'm like ah oh, this is great <laughs> so yeah the work that we were under that we were part of amazing to just like talk about Watoto and Watoto orphanages well they don't call themselves orphanages but uh, if you're familiar with what happened just I'll just say social turmoil you know, over the course of decades in Uganda, these villages were set up where children are rescued. And as the children are rescued, they're given a home. They're placed in a home with a mama and the mama has eight children and the children are brought up in like a real like family structure. And I was invited in by our mutual good friend, Bradley. And so Brad invited us in to be a part of taking our giftings and our passions and just come alongside of that beautiful work. So here I am, I'm coming, you know, I, I was invited to paint portraits of all the different, both the children and, you know, the workers who were there. And Sean was there to inspire, you know, through coffee, bring together the community and just like kind of like linking everyone's hands together. So uh, yeah, that's how Sean and I met. So you're, you're there, you're with these young adults and you, and you see this middle-aged washed up rock and roll drummer turned coffee maker <laughs> Scott. and what tell me about those war stories what, what are the first things that you heard or learned about what was your first impressions of Sean first of all he had hilarious stories about like being in youth groups in the 90s and just like I, I I'm please permit me for a moment to just be super critical Sure. <laughs> I did not mix all that well with like the Christian like rock scene in a certain sense. And Sean had all the backroom stories of just like these with his great sense of like ironic humor to flesh out all, <laughs> all the things I suspected about those like bands that were just like, you know, again, blasted over loudspeakers towards my face all through my teenage years. And he lived in the back room and he had hilarious stories that like, I was rolling like <laughs> to hear what he had to say. It was just like, ah, oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> like a window into this world that is no longer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, John, John lived in that same world. So he did even more so than I, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing. There's a lot of talent and a lot of people get invited to be on stage or an organization because of their talents, which, you know, Kevin has, but there's very few people that are authentically themselves and really have an excellent North compass in a very humble way. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm a gut guy and besides, besides the age, you know, I don't want to be impressed. I want to be impressed at how kind of authentically humble and grounded you are. And I think that's what being in the arts with, again, with his background and my brother's in the art world and there's a lot of ego involved and there's a lot of posturing, <laughs> you know, and again, Kevin can probably speak to that more than I, but that's just, that's what I respect about him. And really why I thought he'd be so good on this podcast because 
he's excellent at what he does. And obviously his resume reflects that, but just a really good dude that, that I respect and seems to be through and through, right. Not perfect, but is just honest and, and tackles life in, in ways that, that you can build trust in your relationship rather quickly. So kudos to you, man, for, for, for being that type of guy. And, and I, I really respect it. If we could jump into that trip, Kevin, you were brought to paint portraits, I'm assuming, of these kids? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're sitting with these kids that are, that are orphans, basically, for hours, looking at them. I would imagine when you're painting someone's portrait, there's a connection that happens that's beyond just what's happening in the room. Yeah, uh, yeah. Tell us about that and how that impacted your life as you sat with these kids all day really examining them and trying to capture what you feel on the canvas. Yeah. I mean, that, that opens up a whole entire world of just is levels of interesting, like it's both dialogue, it's introspection yourself as an artist, and then it's hopefully dispassionate, dispassionate observation of another person. And it's, you know, I'll start with something tangential to what you just said and bring it back around. I'm a happily married man. I have been with my wife now for 20 years, and I really enjoy painting incredibly beautiful women. <laughs> like, I'm just giving you like a random example. I also like if we, I have an old gnarled guy like or whatever. And there's this, there's this dynamic that's so interesting that when you are painting someone that is like that beautiful, you have like a communion between souls in mm. a certain sense. I've done work in juvenile detention centers. I've just painted random people in the middle of a barn in North Dakota. You're in communion with their soul and it's deeply fulfilling. But then you're also as an artist, when you're painting someone's portrait, you're also a dispassionate observer and you're trying to not form judgments just trying to draw and paint what you see and not force that person to be anything that they actually are not. So here I am, I'm in, you know, these in Watoto and I'm drawing and painting away. And I couldn't, I didn't know the stories of all of the people I was painting, except for one woman, but I was not allowed to know the stories. And nobody ever explicitly said like, you cannot know this, but, but they, it was understood that some of these children, like, you know, they had gone through like the Lord's resistance army, like, and now they're like, you know, they're 20 something years old, or some of these children had been like full on, like slaves, like literally farmhand slaves from the time that they were like two and three years old. So I, but I couldn't know anyone's story, but as you sit and you look at like this, like cool, like little guy or this this young woman is a communion of souls that's so deeply fulfilling. And so I, on one hand, I just wanted to only observe what I could see. But then on another hand, I, the entire time I paint portraits or draw portraits, I talk naturally, I never forced. And as you talk, things start coming out and they make their way into the portrait. So if someone just has like a really jovial spirit and they never ever speak to their pain then that almost like triumphant sense can make its way into the portrait so with the young woman that i painted i'm not going to say her name they asked to always keep everything private but as i painted her portrait she she was like literally one of the most joyful people i have ever met in my life and i still don't know her story but there's this beautiful communion of souls and her eyes were so penetrating to me, this, this young woman. And again, she never led on to any of the hurt that she experienced. And I thought of the story that Mark Twain had, and I'm going to butcher it, but Mark Twain, he said that one of the most beautiful people he ever met, one of the most, someone who exuded joy, again, these are all my words, was a woman who was a former slave whose children were taken away from her and sold at auction when she was a young woman. And as an older woman, she was on, I forget where Mark Twain met her, but he met her at like an estate and through the various sales of the slaves, somehow a man was sold to the estate where she was. 
And she was talking to the man for a little bit and she realized that her little baby that was sold at auction, that this was him and he was now a man. And she was the most grateful, loving, joyful person that Mark Twain had ever met. And he knew, this woman knew what it was to lose everything. So she appreciated her son that was like lost and now found like more than anybody. So as I'm painting these portraits in Watoto, this is all coming through in their faces for me. But again, I, I didn't know the specific stories, but I'm like, wow, like I've painted plenty of people in New York who are pretty miserable <laughs> and it shows on their faces and they're just, they're just weary or they're just distracted. With these, these people, they were in the room with me. They were there and they were there a hundred percent with me. It was just so beautiful. I think through your craft and maybe, it, I don't know if it's intentional, if it's personality or if it's trained, but translating what you're describing to <clears throat> the, the male experience, right? I feel like that's many depths deeper <laughs> than, than many guys would experience a few times in their life right? Like what you're talking about. And some may not even understand what you're talking about in their whole life. Do you find that, that the art taught you to see people and connect in that manner? Or is that something that you always had and, and it translates into the art? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question that I've never pondered before, Sean. And to kind of like a stream of consciousness meander through that, Sure. <laughs> I, I would say, I would say that it might be circular, that the one informs the other. I, I just remember being a boy and sometimes my mother, she just felt it on her heart to fast and to just not, not eat for a little bit, just to like, you know, focus on something. And by 10 o'clock in the morning, I would say to my mom, I would say, mom, what's wrong? Like, I remember, I actually remember saying, mom, what's wrong? I was like, probably six, seven years old. She'd be like, nothing, yeah. I'm fine. It'd be like 10, 30 in the morning, 11. I'd be like, mom, what's wrong? Mom, what's wrong? <sighs> and she was, she would say like, how is it that you always know? Like when, when I'm fasting, like I'm fasting, you know, until evening today, I'm just like really like setting myself apart for the, just like, you know, to contemplate things and whatever. And she's like, you could like, you can read me. She's like, how do you do that? I was like, I don't know. Like, I, I just thought it was normal. And then at that same time, I would sit and for hours, I would love to like, let's say like draw like a sibling's portrait, but I loved looking in their eyes. And I loved the whole idea of just capturing like, it's almost like a little kid taking a jar, running out to the yard, capturing, catching some fireflies, and then just putting it inside, except paintings last forever. And you're almost like catching someone's soul. Right. And so I almost feel like the art was born out of that. But then what's been interesting for me is if art, if painting portraits, let's say it was birthed from just loving people and just being interested in them, then as I drew, as I draw and paint portraits, it opens me up to people who otherwise I'd be cut off from. Sure. When I was young, we grew up in like a decent neighborhood. Like it, it was on the border of like a really rough area where all the MS-13 guys um, are in New York. So like a, just a lot of gangs and stuff like that. Back then, I don't even know what gangs were around, but I got jumped by a gang and I got beat up really bad by them. And afterwards I was really despondent. And I just felt like this sense of bitterness just coursing through me where I, a lot of my friends got together and like, Hey, we're going to find the guys who jumped to you and we're going to, we're just going to go beat them senseless. Then fast forward, the cops had me go to the house and identify the guys who beat me up. And I saw the dad open the door and the gutters are hanging off the front of the house. The, there were cars up on blocks on the front lawn. There's grass that hasn't been mowed in forever. And the dad opens up the front door and I was like, oh, he's a raging alcoholic. And then I see the kid who beat me up, walked out of the house. The father clenches his fist at his side. And I was like, oh my goodness, that kid's going to get destroyed tonight. His father's just going to beat him. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I went from like really hating these kids to like, thinking like wow if i grew up in that house i'd i'd be just as angry i'd jump right. some innocent little kid and i mean 
so fast forward to years later and I was doing a lot of art sales out in the Hamptons, a lot of commissions, teaching, and I would drive by the Riverhead Maximum Security Jail. And the Riverhead Maximum Security Jail has like the worst guys you can imagine. They're, you know, they're, they're there waiting to get either hold off to prison or whatever. They're going to court. And I felt to my heart, go paint portraits of these guys, go draw their portraits. And I didn't want to open my heart up to that. I was like, these are the people that jumped me. They really hurt me. Like I've been around again, like I'm not saying I had such a rough childhood. I had a beautiful home that I grew up in and my parents were wonderful, but I just couldn't shake it. Just go out there and draw portraits. So like a, a short time later, I was inside of jail cells with these criminals at the invitation of the warden. And I'm literally drawing portraits of the very type of people that really hurt me. You know what I mean? And as I draw their portrait, they talk to me about their lives. I'm, you're in communion with their souls. There's this beautiful, rich dialogue where they let their guard down. And all of a sudden you look at the other side and you're like, hey, that's a human sitting across from me. And sometimes the portraits uh, that I painted, they were very sad because the person was cut off. One guy said to me, he's like, my only mistake being here in this jail is that I wasn't smart enough. And he's like, when I get out of here, I'm going to commit more crime. I'm going to do worse things. I'm going to make more money. Only I'm not going to get caught. And when I drew his portrait, I put his head down. And he's, I painted him and he's just, he would always clean his fingernails. He never made eye contact. That was someone who was just totally unrepentant. And that was a very hard portrait for me to paint. And then another guy, he, he was the biggest guy in the whole jail. He had like arms out to here. He was just a beast. He looked like the scariest guy in the jail. He's covered in tattoos. And I painted his portrait and he came in and he had, after I was, I would go in week after week and he came in and he had staples across all across the top of his head. And I was like, Speedy, this is his nickname, Speedy, what's up? Like, what happened to you? And he's like, nothing. I don't want to talk about it. He's like, so he sits for the portrait and whatever. I'm finishing up the, the painting. And I loved this guy. And yet he was the biggest beast in the whole entire jail. And one of the CEOs came up to me. They're like, hey, Kevin, can we talk to you? I was like, yeah. They're like, you painted the most amazing portrait of Speedy. Do you know how he got those staples in his head? I was like, no. And he was like, he might look like the meanest guy in the whole jail, but he protects any young boy who comes into the jail, he personally protects them from all the predators. And he's like, so we call him a guardian angel. So he got all those staples. He's got his skull split open because he stepped in between a man who was trying to take, you know, a young boy and he defended the boy. And he's like, that guy is a hero. And like, we love him. And I painted his portrait and it came out in his eyes. It was just so unbelievable. And like, I never without art would have had the chance to have like communion with that soul. That's someone I, who I would have, if he was on one side of the street, I would have crossed to the other side of the street and been like, he's a bad dude. <laughs> mm. But then by the end of it, you find out, no, he's not even like actually a career criminal. He's someone who like, you know, really struggled with drug addiction. And he had a role to play in that jail and he knew it and he protected dozens of kids, if not scores of kids' lives. It's amazing. Mm. Earlier, you used a term as a portrait painter. You were talking about being kind of what, were, what was the term you used? Not judgmental or not. What was the phrase that you used? Yeah, like dispassionate and observation. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Well, it's first of all, it's not true. <laughs> so, John Singer Sargent, who's definitely a favorite painter of mine, and I studied in the tradition of John Singer Sargent. My teacher in Italy studied it's hard to go through the lineage, but it's like a generation away where John Singer Sargent taught this group in Boston and they taught my teacher. And John Singer Sargent was well known for saying that he doesn't make any judgments. He just paints what he sees. And I actually don't agree with that. He said, he would say, maintain that all the time. And I'm like, I don't even think that's possible. Right. Because any of us <laughs> in any given moment, you can't help but make judgments and assessments of everything. In fact, if you suspended that, 
you probably would die in a week because you, right. you know, you'd get on a bus on a bus and you'd sit next to a guy that you shouldn't be sitting next to. <laughs> so we're all making judgments minute by minute. So that's the one end of things that, but then if you, if you flip it to the other side of the, the other pole and you come to your subject with a predetermined conclusion, like, Oh, let's say I, sh I saw Sean, I saw you, you get on the bus. I'm like, Oh, I know this guy. I know exactly what he's all about. Like, I know I have friends who talk like that. Oh, I know what you're all about. Like, I know what this guy's all about. And they haven't even spoken to the person yet. And yet they've already come to all conclusions about who they are. Right. And that that's awful. I mean, I think that's a, that's a terrible way to live life to be, to have, to not be inquisitive and to come to con conclusions. Yeah. So we just said like the two twin poles, one, you're dispassionate. You don't form judgments Two, you come with all pre predetermined conclusions. So which one is it? Like, how do you paint? And the only answer that I have to that is you live with that constant tension <laughs> in the same way that like an engine has like a piston firing and it pushes. And then the other one goes down and that pushes. And through that motion, you know, we have the drive shaft and the thing moves forward. So for me, when I come to a subject, if I think of like a little kid as being incredibly sweet, like kids are sweet, paint a kid's portrait. They're incredibly sweet. I just paint the little kid's portrait. And if his mother heard this right now, she would laugh her head off. She'd be like, you're exactly right. He was a little dictator. <laughs> and so I didn't come to him with the conclusion that he's a sweet little kid. I came to him with the conclusion that he's like this little powerhouse. He's got a searing intellect. He can name every country on the globe. He can name all of them. He, he's actually done it in front of my sons. So I painted his portrait and I put a map behind his head. So I didn't come to conclusions about who he was. And I listened to what the kid had to say in conversation. And while the kid was talking, he goes like this. So I, I'm painting him pretty much almost like mugshot forward because he sat that way. He just sat like very forward. And then as we're talking, the kid starts describing how he thinks the world I mean, this kid is nine years old. He's like how he thinks the world power systems are set up. And as he talks, he goes like this and he tilts his head to the side. It was fantastic. I was like, oh my goodness. But I had already been painting for two, three hours. And I was like, oh, got to write the ship. I just grabbed paper towel. I wiped out his head. And then I tilted the axis of his head this way. His neck's going this way. His head's going that way. And his head is in his hands. And he has such a deliciously inquisitive look about him again like i'm not saying this kid is has the slightest bad bone in his body but like he's interesting he's a thinker like and so his portrait now is finished and is he's just like that and he's looking at you and my one of my sons walked in the room and he knows this boy and he said dad oh my goodness did you capture him you captured like that that way that he has and the peering brilliant like gaze that he has so that required two things on my behalf i had to be objective not come to a conclusion about who this you know little guy was and i had to be judgmental and say like no you do have a bit of a <laughs> of like a i don't know a thing to you that's like fantastic and i'm going to capture it so it's again it's pistons firing and i just try to honor both of them and live with that friction so Man, I think there's, gosh, there's so much in that, what you just said. Our, you know, our podcast, The Known Experience, we talk about three things. We talk about knowing ourselves, being vulnerable to let others know us, and then being curious to get to know others. And I think that last one is probably just to be, you know, kind of uh, generalizing. That's one that men are typically not great at. You know, women that just meet will sit down for hours over coffee and like ask every detail about the other yeah. person's life. You know, pretty much find out about your career and your family and your hobbies and we're kind of done, right? But your job is to look past all of that, right? Your job is to be curious, to know people. I feel like we should be mentored by you on that. But the, I think the prison thing is really interesting because I worked with a guy a couple months ago who kind of had a similar experience as you. He is a triage nurse in a prison and he works the night shift. And he yeah. goes in at like 11 o'clock at night and these criminals come in and he has to heal them. He has to yeah. care for them. It's a lot. 
and, and here he is night after night after night bringing healing and caring which he's committed to as a nurse to the people he knows have brought harm to others done just the opposite as to yeah. what he and the only thing he could really connect it to, or I think what inspired him the most out of it was that like Jesus washed the feet of Judas. Wow. Like this wow. is my opportunity. You know, Steve Garber, who was on our podcast a while back said to know and still love is the greatest of all. Yeah. And it's easy to know. It's easy to love people. Sometimes the less we know about them, right? Because mm. There's no baggage. There's no like critique. Self. They're highlight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating that you get to do that every day for work. That's, that's awesome. It, it's such an honor because like I, just before, you know, we hopped on to talk to each other, I dropped off a portrait commission of one of the top democratic Democrat party assemblymen in New York state. So he's, he's really big here on Long Island. He's, he's on the front cover of newspapers and before that, I painted a portrait of the top Republican politician. And in a, anyone who looks at that, like the art world gives you this, it's like you get x-ray vision to see the cross sections of like the strata of like, I don't know, an archaeological site. You can see the layers. And like, so I paint the two portraits and guess what? Behind closed doors, these guys play basketball together. They're good friends. And not in the sense of like collusion, I just mean like two people who are working for the betterment of society. And so each one of them brought up the other politician. So they serve two districts right side by side. And when the other politician came up, because they knew I was painting, they both knew I was painting the other portrait, separate commissions altogether. What they said, they were like, if everyone had as much integrity as that guy, America would be in a great place. But they're talking about the opposing political party. And then you learn more and more. And it's like, wow, these, these guys actually like, they're both old school and they really see peace and well-being in society through just cooperation, you know, care. And they're both against the ruthless exploitation, the both of them. I would never have had a window into these politicians' lives without it, but I get to spend eight, 10, 15, 20 hours with each of these guys. And one of them went up for re-election while I was painting his portrait. And while I was painting his portrait, he lost re-election. Mm. And to live, you know, and see him go through the pain of that and to see how he was getting like smeared online by false accusations. And I'm, I'm with him and I'm like, in a way you kind of feel like, you know, you feel like a fly on the wall. Right? <laughs> and yet in another way, like for a moment, you feel like you're their friend. It's it's really beautiful. And it, every day, like I, I always joke around, like I'm one of the few people that go to sleep at night and I, I actually can't wait to get up in the morning because I just can't wait to get to what I love doing. That's definitely an idealistic statement because I hate administration and <laughs> the business end of art is unbelievably brutal, <laughs> but the chance to sit down and like I've been saying, like the communion of souls, whether it's with your really beautiful woman or a politician or a child. It's just like, wow, what a gift. It's so fun. So what do you do with, with, you know, we were talking about it briefly before the podcast began. One of the biggest disappointments with relationships is expectation on whoever you're in relationship with, right. And their, their reciprocation of that, of your expectation and just a give and take but generally re, the good relationships are two people meet really well right and it, there's just a good ebb and flow but yeah the best way to approach relationships is to kind of like what you said so you have judgment but it's not rigid right so we all have judgment but do you find that because you view art in this way of seeing people and kind of everything is positive right well you see them for who they are and you accept it right that would be relationships would be a lot easier and we'd all have probably more and deeper relationships if we implemented that same way in reality, but we don't because whether it's ego or relationships are self-serving or the hurt is too great because of your, of the missed expectation, you know, we, we tend to withdraw and not develop relationships. So has this helped you with 
with your relationships, you know, the, the, the ones that are with you every day, or is it kind of unique to the art process in this? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, your inter- your, your question earlier was interesting because I, I just never thought of it uh, earlier. And then you're saying something again. I haven't really thought about whether that spills over into the day-to-day relationships. If I had to, I would say it certainly does. It couldn't not spill over because who you are when you're working away, like in the studio, some days I put in 10, 12 hours of work, you know, some days like two or three hours of painting, but I just mean, and then I, I go back home. I think it does teach me to listen more. Hmm. Every person is, is a universe, right? They're galaxies. They're, they, we, we don't know how big we are. You know, like it, it'll, we have all eternity to actually gaze upon eternity and then to realize just how infinite we are. Like, I really believe that. Otherwise, eternity would be horrible because we'd come to the end of our galaxy and we'd just be like, oh, it's over. Like, and then <laughs> the awe that you have when you paint someone's portrait, in particular, if it's a really interesting person and you're just joint, like, then you go back and I, I go to my wife and my wife and I, I would never like be so silly as to say like, oh, we have this perfect relationship. But like, I just really appreciate her. Like, I really enjoy her. And like, at the end of the night, the problem we always have is we sit in this back like sunroom in the warmer weather. And I just want to hear how her day went, but I'm not forcing it. Like, I, I really am really interested to hear how her day goes. And I think that comes from being fascinated with the universe of another person in the sense of painting. Hmm. And I think it rolls over to myself and Margaret, you know what I mean? Or I talk to my dad every single day on the phone. Like, I, I don't think I ever miss a day. And it's, I don't do it because an alarm goes off and I have to. I'm actually really interested in the guy. <laughs> like, he's actually pretty fascinating. He's a huge, burly guy born in Ireland, work construction. And yet he can quote every line from every Jane Austen book and movie that you've ever heard. <laughs> like, it's like... And I'm always, hey, dad, I'm going through something. I have a big business decision to make. What are your thoughts on it? And he has a totally different perspective than I do. But again, it's that sense of wonder and realizing that you're dealing with infinite, eternal beings. And C.S. Lewis, he has an interesting quote on that. He says, you have never met a mere mortal. Everyone with whom you speak, everyone with whom you work, you, you marry, you exploit, they are on the other side of this, they're eternal creatures. And he says, they'll either be in absolute marvel that you can't even behold, or they'll be so wretched. You can't behold them, but like, you're not dealing with like anything that's normal. (laughs) And I read that years ago by C.S. Lewis. And I was like, man, to go through life with that sense of wonder that every single person you meet is eternal. Like, oh my goodness. Like everything changes then even the lady at the department of motor vehicles, She's kind of interesting, you know, <laughs> even if she's not, she still is. So I love that uh, phrase you use the universe of another person. I think, yeah, I think it's easy for us to identify other people by some bullet points that we yeah. pop into our head about their job or judgments we make looking at them or maybe negative aspects we know about them that we kind of like affiliate them with. And we don't realize there's so much depth beyond that of every human, right? Yeah. But if I could take that phrase and pivot, the idea of a universe. During COVID, you got launched into another universe. Yeah. Africa. Rhino. Africa Rhino. Yeah. Yeah. To get to the African Rhino, I'll abbreviate a a dark period, period when I was working on something and really it was like seven years of hard work building a studio and education. And I'm just gonna abbreviate the whole thing and say it collapsed. And I had to walk away from it. Definitely the most painful thing up to that point I had been through in my life. And when something like that happens and you see everything evaporate in a moment and you now are in like a new place, my phone used to be like buzzing, like round the clock. I would have hundreds of texts, like, you know, emails, phone calls. And now all of a sudden everything's over and nobody's even contacting me anymore. There's this 
there's a sense of you can start to feel bad for yourself really quick, which I did. I felt really bad for myself. I lost 100% of my income. I had been neglecting my painting career at that point, really, for the purpose of building this arts institution. And COVID was not a thing yet. It didn't exist. So some of my friends who I went to school with in Italy, they are from the UK. And they heard how I had gone through a really hard time. And so one of my friends, she's a really cool girl. Her name is Joe Ria. If you are from the UK and you know the song Josephine, that's based off of my friend Joe. And her dad is Chris Ria, one of the most famous like UK pop rockers, kind of like a Billy Joel. So Joe Ria reaches out. She's like, hey, I heard what happened. You can use my studio in London. And so I picked up my family. I moved my whole entire family to London. And it was just a hard period of time. It was just like we had very little income. I was painting like mad to try to just generate some painting sales. And my buddy, James Hayes, a great, great painter. He had a studio two doors over in Barons Court, London. And so he has his swank studio. They let me use that amazing studio. It was unbelievable. It's like a wrought iron cathedral. And I'm just hurting. I'm just and I feel very alone and not many people are reaching out. Like my good friends are faithful, but it blew my mind that I went from being so like at the center of all the activity to, to nothing. And there was also something wonderful about that because I was really saturated. So it was a mixture of many things. I find out another friend of mine in the interest of abbreviating the story, she worked with Boris Johnson. She said, Hey, listen, there's this weird virus going around and it's just like, you know, the sniffles, but you guys should know about it. And that was the first time we heard about COVID. And then we're in the heart of London. We're surrounded by a lot of Italians. And all of a sudden they're like, they just shut down Italy. Now my wife and I, we were planning to go from London. We're going to go back to Italy. We're going to live there for like a year. I was going to create paintings, try to ship them back to the U S and sell them Italian themed paintings sell pretty well, pretty easily. And so we had like a, a future in front of us that we were pivoting towards. And then that's over. We literally took the last plane out of Europe. President Trump closed down all flights. We took the very last plane that they were letting back into the United States. And so we're back now in New York and I'm sitting there alone. I have no paintings to sell. I have Nobody, but nobody is buying any artwork right now at the beginning of the lockdown. So the world is locked down at this point. And I just, I'm feeling really bad for myself, like big time. And that's a dangerous place to be. And I knew that it was a dangerous place to be. But one of the reasons why I also picked up my family, moved them to London, was to get myself out of the trap of thinking that the whole world revolved around Kevin McAvoy and that the whole world revolved around my big arts institution. Like I had to tell, I had to prove to myself that I was really being myopic. But now here I am, I'm back in New York and I'm faced with all the realities I was trying to run from before. So as I'm just like going through this, it was such a, a time of soul searching, loneliness. I just, I was reading the story of Moses. And then after that, I came across like John the Baptist, but I was like, how many men have been made in deserts? That's actually where men are made. They're made in the deserts. They don't, they don't come into being when they're like the princes of Egypt. Like that's, that's when you're the most distracted. Like, I was like, wait a minute, I could pivot off of all of this. And this season in front of me of the lockdown, not only is, is it not necessarily going to destroy me, but maybe like, maybe something even more beautiful is going to come out of it. Like, and so it was like a willed decision to see this thing beautifully, but nothing really presented itself. So out of nowhere, a friend called and she said, Hey, listen, I've, my heart's been hurting. I just know that you're out of work, that you have no income. What if you take everything that you've taught to, I taught her daughter to, you know, scores of students. What if you put it all online and create this online learning platform for classical art. And I was like, that's fantastic. That's really cool. I would love to do that. I just don't know anything about videography. So I get going with that. 
starting to record things, still there's no momentum in terms of business. And then I still for sure was feeling bad for myself because my world got difficult three, four months before the lockdown even started. <laughs> and then my friend Brady Forseth calls and Brady Forseth's the CEO and founder, co-founder of the African Community and Conservation Foundation. And he works with Paul Tudor Jones. And he, Brady says to me, Brady's my friend. And I'm like, hey, Brady, how's it going? He's like, it's, it's all right. I was like, what's up? I was like, you seem upset. And he goes, the African people are really struggling right now. Boom. It just like blew me out of my little like self-pity, you know, vortex. And then he's like, and on top of it, there's only a few hundred Eastern black rhino left on the face of planet earth. I didn't know this. I didn't even know what an Eastern black rhino was, but I mean, it's a, of the few subspecies, whatever they call it. Like there was only a few hundred left. And my friend Brady has devoted his life to just helping, just lifting up in any way he can, just the people and the wildlife that he loves in Africa. So he just shares how the poachers were coming in from China and from Russia and it's basically like their cartels. They go in and they shoot the Eastern black rhino. They shave, you know, the horn off. We all know the story. And so their numbers were dropping daily. And he says to me, but like, it's just so hard to get momentum. So as this is going on, I'm, I'm just plugging away like steadily at just drawing and painting and things of that sort. And I just say to myself, well, here I am learning these like videography skills. That's pretty cool. What if I took what I'm learning in videography and I just did a drawing of an Eastern black rhino. So I looked up an Eastern black rhino. I have like 30 pictures. And then I set up my cameras that I'd been experimenting with and I click them on. I do a time lapse. I finish up with the drawing. The house is filled with kids and dogs barking and I just get the video done. I set it to really awesome music. I put some text over it because now I'm really learning how to make like tiny little short films. And I send it off to my friend Brady that night. Brady gets on the phone the next morning and he's like, Hey, Kev, do you have a few minutes? I'm like, yeah, I do. What's up? And he's like, I took the video that you created and I sent it off to Charlie Mayhew. I was like, what? Charlie Mayhew is like, the founder, I, I don't know his official title. He's like the executive director, founder of Tusk, like Tusk, which I've been following in the National Geographic ever since I was a boy. It's like Charlie Mayhew, the one who went into like the Congo, like when there was genocide taking place, like he rescued like silverback gorillas in Uganda. Like he's like, yeah, he's on, he, he really liked your video that you did of the Eastern black rhino. I was like, oh, cool. And he's like, he wants to talk to you. And in the art world, you hear stuff like this all the time. Like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay. And he's like, no, no, he really wants to talk to you. Uh, I was like, okay, when? He's like, he's on the phone right now. Are you okay to jump on a Zoom call? So click, all of a sudden I'm talking to Charlie Mayhew. I'm like, it was the coolest thing. He's like, Kevin, absolutely brilliant drawing. We really enjoyed it. And he goes, I actually showed it to Prince William and he thought it was fantastic. Like it was just stuff to that effect where he, he showed it to his circle and Prince William's I don't want to say is his only charity, but the charity on which he has a great emphasis is Tusk. And so he's like, yeah, the Duke of Cambridge and the whole entire, we're going to put the full force of Tusk behind. He goes, how long did it take you to do that? I was like, oh, two hours. And he's like, we have boardrooms filled with people and we try to dream up videos like that. And he's like, you did that in two hours. And then he goes, would you like to work with Tusk? And I was like, yeah, like count me in. Sure. So I got off that call. And I was like, well, who could I connect to who? Because I'm a nobody, but the art world has through my life, like connected me to a lot of people. I was like, who can I connect? And so I have a friend up on the North shore, Elizabeth Jordan, and I'll just be really direct in saying that she was a billionaire and she's, she's a billionaire who knows a lot of people. And then I would be in Elizabeth's studio and Hugh Jackman would stop by and I would teach Hugh Jackman's son. And then Maria Bello would come out like it was her studio was like this rotating cast of like fashion designers and movie stars. And so then I, I call up Elizabeth. I was like, Hey, Elizabeth, I know that you've been to Africa. Elizabeth is a phenomenal photographer. One of the best photographers I've met in my life. I was like, Elizabeth, you want to work on a project together? Like 
Tusk is interested in working. She's like, yeah, let's do it. So we all got a group phone call. We are on the Zoom call. And all of a sudden, before, as we're all speaking, Charlie's like saying hello to Elizabeth. Elizabeth's like, let me get my friend Donna Karen on the phone. So Donna Karen's face pops up on the screen. And then this person's face. And as I look at it, before I know it, like the whole entire screen is filled with like movie stars and fashion designers and billionaire philanthropists. And the thing just took off like wildfire. And so we're talking about what we might be able to do. And so this idea was hatched between all of us to that a line would be sculpted and then artists would paint on top of the line. So I wasn't the one who birthed that idea, but I kind of gave my artistic thoughts as it was evolving. So that's what happened. We had these lines created. They were shipped over from London. I went to a foundry in Brooklyn with Elizabeth we got the foundry in Brooklyn to make casts of this lion. And then the casts of the lion were sent out to all top artists, movie stars. Like, forgive me, I don't know the name of the guitarist from Rolling Stone. He's still around right now. He he got a lion. It was just like every like former presidents were going to like, at one point we were talking to them about like being a part of it. So everyone got their lions. And then we painted on top of the lion. And I realized in the midst of all this, I was like, you know, I felt really bad for myself just like one month ago. And, you know, as a man, you can give up. You can. Like, what does giving up look like? Like, it could look like many things. I never, it never crossed my mind to do any of these things. But some people give up on life when their businesses collapse and they look embarrassed in front of the whole world. Some people give up on their marriage. Some people give up on their kids. Some people just, they just jet, you know. Again, those things didn't go through my mind. But I thought of the Emily Dickinson poem, and I'm going to butcher it right now because I don't have it memorized perfectly. I don't memorize anything perfectly. But it's hope is the thing with feathers that perches on the edge of the heart. And hope is real. And hope is tangible. It is a bird with feathers, and it does perch on the edge of the heart. Like, we can call it into being. I'm like, this is really cool. This is gaining momentum. So I created my line. Everyone's finished up there. We put them all at this event out on the east end of Long Island. Everyone else, they're the geniuses running this event. I, I had no I had no hand in pulling off the event, but I just helped artistically everywhere that I could. The auction started. I don't have the official numbers in front of me, but by the end of the night, a million dollars was raised and the lines were all auctioned off to collectors across the world. In London, they had their series of sales and stuff like that. And that money went to the Grimetti Fund so that children would have literacy programs. It went to like just general food. It went to the preservation of these Eastern black rhinos. So they sent over videos and they said, hey, just so you can see what you have you were a part of. And there are these Eastern black rhinos. They would tranquilize them, they blindfold them, and then they would helicopter them from an area that was filled with poachers and then they would drop them off in a safe preserve. And then Paul Trudor Jones, to his credit, spent a lot of money hiring anti-poachers to protect these Eastern black rhinos. So it's, they have, I mean, so much land, I don't even know that he's a steward of. And then there are these guys who are paid well, it's their full-time job to watch all these rhinos. And so their numbers are actually, from what I've heard, their numbers are rebounding and you know they've been protected. But again, it all came from me from this one little drawing, just like sitting at my table and also acquiring that videography thing and just kind of smashing it all together. And before I knew it, I was like, wow, it's six months after all this pain. And I can actually see a trajectory for a future that I like much more than what I've been lamenting that collapsed behind me. And that's two and a half years ago now. But now I, I've built something called Classical Art at Home, and it's a website. And just today, I landed a few more schools. So entire schools are signing up with their student base to learn classical art. And I also infuse everything with art history. But it's like literally just today. Today was a big day. And I'm two and a half years beyond that point. But like, I come into the studio and I'm in heaven. Like I, I have like these like overhead cameras where you can see me like drawing like right there. And then I have like another angle where you can see screens. I have like this behind me where I set up like still life objects. 
And then I go into my studio, but as I paint, I live stream and I can talk to all the kids and the kids can actually see me working on all these things. And I'm talking to them and I don't have a boardroom full of people with like one guy at the top, just screaming at me, telling me what to do all day long. Like, this is mine. Like I get to run this with like a good friend, Camille and my wife, Margaret, like, and I love it. And so it's like, so beautiful how from ashes, you know, beauty can rise and it all kind of in a way came from that Eastern black rhino, <laughs> like in a really cool way. So I'm just so grateful. <laughs> you know, I think it came from you, uh, you know, you said men are made in deserts and I think that's worthy of like a whole podcast, but you were in a dark moment. You'd lost everything. COVID hit on top of that, like tragedy on top of tragedy. You're just spinning, trying to figure out how to survive. And you hear somebody else's pain, your friend with the Wildlife Foundation. And, and instead of just being like, yep, yeah, it sucks for everybody right now, you focused on his struggle. And that ended up being your way out of your own struggle. That's yeah, so interesting. You yeah. think that's accurate? Oh, 100%. That's, that is 100. It was you know, it's a wonderful life. You know, Clarence like throws himself off the bridge <laughs> to like, say, it was a moment. And then Jimmy Stewart snaps out of it. And he's like, I got to go save that guy. And that's how Clarence, the angel, like, I know it's a, a cliche movie. But I love that moment where it's like Jimmy Stewart or George Bailey says like, there's pain right there. And I'm going to step outside of me for a moment. I'm so glad that Clarence threw himself into the water in front of me, <laughs> you know? Great. Sean. I'll say this, that is the, also the long answer to why meeting you was meant so much to me in Uganda, because you shared your story. And I was like, oh, here's another freak <laughs> who's had a roller coaster of a ride and he's on the other side of it and he's funny and joyful. Like you, you can get a whole room like whipped up into like a frenzy of like laughter and you pivoted off of things that had happened in your world. And I really needed to know that that was like, that I really needed it again. Like I keep coming back to like the communion of souls. Like I needed to know that you went through it and that you were interpreting it in a positive way. Like it was huge for me. It was so special. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, it's, it's good, but I, I also feel like in those moments, it's not for me, it's sure it's a choice, but it's a choice because the alternative is scarier. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's not like an, it's not like an overflow or this great strength or resilience, or maybe it is, <laughs> but it's more, thinking through, okay, this season, if I decide to change in ways that are X, Y, and Z, right? So I, I stop creating, right? I stop trying because of this season. Who do I turn into? And I, I kind of go there. And that person is far more unhappy and tortured than to try and fail again and try and fail again. Right. Yeah. There is no hope there. There's, there's, it becomes very monotone. And, and so, yeah, when I met you over a year ago, that's what it was almost like this delirium of there's endless paths I can travel. Right. And I might, they might be full of dead ends, but I really do believe that we have far more opportunities in life, but we often think that we only have a few. And when we, when we narrow that focus into, I only have a few and I'm trapped. The end result of that in five years is, is not good. Right. Yeah. And so, so, so I say all that because it, it's really seeing that that was my focus, right? I, I do not want to be this. I do not want to lose my creativity. I do not want to lose my, the importance of my why. And so the only decision is to, to be this way. 
but then when you find other guys, you know, are walking through, John walked through a similar thing that have their eyes wide open, but they also aren't the guys preaching about all the answers, right? They're like, man, I, I came out of it. It was my story. I'm very happy about that, but it's not because I have this great insight. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's life is dynamic and it's exhausting and it's beautiful and it's layered and it's nuanced and it's tragic. And, but yeah, that's just the, those are the special moments. I think for me, you know, when you're talking about painting someone and seeing their lines and the curvature of their neck and meaning of souls, I feel like when I'm in a state of being very present and intentional in life and not being distracted, distracted by fears and anxiety. And I see and I experience people much like you paint them. You know, I, I also, Kevin, as I've listened to you on this podcast, there's a great kind of admiration for, you know, I don't call my dad. I don't sit on the porch and talk to my wife every day. And, you know, again, we're different people, but I think that's the beauty in listening to you. And again, other people's stories is like, it makes you check yourself, right? Like why, why don't I care to do that? Because I want that from someone else, right? I want my dad to call me every day. Yeah. And it's great, man. I mean, that's why we're doing this podcast, right? I think that really struck me as, sheesh, am I so busy in what I want to create and achieve that I've stopped really reserving the energy for those in my life every day. And I need to be better at that. Yeah. I mean, I went through when my wife and I were pregnant with Liam, my first son, and I went through a really just dark period and I didn't know it at the time. It's to, to really collapse the story. We were living in Italy. We we're married for a few years at that point, found out that we were pregnant with Liam, but I was in a way when I was over there, I had a lot of friends, but they're not like life friends. It's like newer, you know, acquaintances. And here I am, I have a kid on the way. I have like, how am I going to turn this art career? Like these paintings I'm doing at this atelier, how am I going to turn them into money to feed that thing? Like this <laughs> chirping bird in a nest. Like, so I had a lot of big questions and I was cut off from everyone in my world just by ge geography. Right. And I got back home and I was mentally not well. Like I really, I just was like, really overwhelmed to the point of almost becoming like non-functional, like almost. And so I reached out to my history teacher from high school and he is 30 years older than me and he's one of my best friends. And we sat down and we talked he, for hours and he walked me through. He's like, well, this isn't the whole thing that he said to me, but one of the things that I came out of it with was I was too isolated and I got caught like in my own head. And I've heard people who have referred to thought patterns as, and you guys probably already know this, but like, it's almost like a thought pattern can be like a dog tied to a stake in the backyard. It's got the rope on its neck and then it just walks in the same path. And if you've ever seen that when I was a little kid, I lived in Ireland, you'd actually see the grooves. It could be like a foot lower than the grass around it just from walking that same path. And my friend. John Contes is his name. He said to me, Kevin, that's your brain. You were so isolated that you were that dog walking that path so long that you didn't even know it. You made grooves in your brain and the grooves in your brain were all filled with darkness. And he's like, so like, I'm not going to be able to feed my kid. I'm going to fail in my career. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be embarrassed in front of my wife. Like real, I was really going through all those thoughts. And he's like, it's so important for you and I to just sit down. So that man took time out of his life and for a few months met with me every Monday night. And we would, he's, again, he's 30 years older than me. And for me, like, he's like my model of success, like coolest guy, loves his kids, just like a fun Greek guy. <laughs> and he's like, we're going to take those grooves that you gave to yourself. And through our friendship, we're going to, we're going to dig new grooves in your brain. 
So every time you think of how you can't do something, you're going to actually displace it with something of a truth. Like I can do this. And it, so it, now I know it's like called cognitive therapy. I right. didn't know it back then. I didn't have the tools to work with. I was 26 years old. So he rewired my brain and I popped out the other side of that. It was gradual. I shouldn't use the word popped out. I gradually emerged from that dark season with a thing of like, I can't outbox depression, but I can sure outrun it. <laughs> like, and if I ever feel myself going in that way in the future, I am going to as quick as possible. I'm going to run to my friends, my family, and I'm going to run as quickly as I can to things that I'm just absolutely fascinated with. I don't think you can take up birding and look at them through telescopes and be depressed. Like, I don't think it's possible. <laughs> like, if you see the flight patterns of like ospreys in my neighborhood, like I was going through that dark period when I got back from Italy, I mean, from London and the ospreys would go up into the trees. And now I had time to look at them and the ospreys would have fish in their claws and they'd eat the fish at the top of the trees in my backyard and all the fish pieces would fall on the ground. And then all I have 25 chickens, the chickens would run over and eat all the fish, but it's just like, that's like outrunning depression for me. Do you know what I mean? Like it like helped <laughs> bump me out of like, that's fascinating. And then I'd watch the ospreys diving into the water and flying off with like these massive fish. And it's like, and then that together with like good friends during the lockdown, and I was like, it was kind of like in the middle of the lockdown where I realized I was like, I'm doing way better now than I was doing before. Like when everything was going really great at this low period, like low, like by like, you know, the world's metrics, like income, I'm doing way better. <laughs> yeah. It's just like so beautiful. So like, yeah, that's, that's been my experience in life is like when I got, when I was isolated, I got in trouble big time and I'll, I don't ever want that again. Yeah. So I think a lot of what you're talking about is we just did an interview with a, a therapist and talked uh, quite a bit about mindfulness and awareness, self-awareness and, you know, recognizing when you're in that rut, recognizing when your thought patterns are circular and un unhelpful. Yeah. And being aware of that and taking action on it instead of feeling, what was that quote from Jung? Uh, until our unconscious becomes conscious, it will rule our lives and we will call it fate. Oh, yeah. wow. Uh, making, that, making that awareness of what, what is ruling my mind right now, and I can take charge over that. Yeah. I, I had a thought to do something now we've never done before. Sean, isn't that exciting <laughs> you to learn this in the middle of the podcast? Let's go. <laughs> Let's do after the interview with Kevin here. So he gets to hear what we got out of his conversation. <laughs> Kevin, this is something we usually log off with the with our guest. And then we jump back on just the two of us and talk about what we learned from it, what we got out of it. Yeah, I enjoy uh, that. Is that cool? You guys got a few that. minutes? Yeah, yeah. Sean, you want to go first? You want me to go first? I feel like I just gushed for like five minutes. I don't know. Yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> but I'm going to edit all that out. So you need to, you, we got to bring it back more concisely. I'll go first. The two, the two things I got out of it. Number one was just like, just being committed to continually discovering the people around. Me. I think that's the hardest to do with people you know the best because you've kind of created this template in your mind of who they are. I think with your family, it's probably some of the hardest kind of fall into these roles and these ideas of each other. And here's who they are. And here's how they're going to react to this. And here's what they're going to say. Here's what they're going to think. I've really been given kind of a wake up in this recently as you know, my mom is 88, and my dad is 90 and has Alzheimer's. And if there is anything I want to extract from their lives, now is the time. And my dad's ability to recall decreases almost weekly. And so there was the time that I just asked him to retell all of his best stories, you know, that we'd heard over the years. And even then I learned things. And it's, it's easy to do when you see your time is short with people but you never know how much time you've got with people. And I, this, that, that's a big one I took away. And, and then lastly, just that when I'm at a low spot to look for needs around me 
and focus on that. And it may be a way out of my low spot, but at the very least, it always lifts my heart to focus on helping someone else. So those, those are my two big takeaways. And it may help me raise $1.5 million for somebody else who knows. Yeah. My takeaways, and I, I, I did already touch on them, but I think, you know, understanding that we all do judge, right? Judgments are there, but how we screen them, right? How we are able to understand they exist, but then still being able to see people and give them space to be who they actually are, right? And clean the canvas off, right? If we're, if we don't get it right is really critical for not just your close friends, but just mankind, right? And walking through life. I think it's such a good skill to develop that culturally we're not great at, you know, even as progressive as we think we are, we're, I feel like we're just not really developing that sense. And so our judgment just grows and, and we're okay with that, right? Like we do create ruts just culturally. So never mind psychologically, we we're, we're deliberately creating ruts. Right. And I think that, so the process for which he paints, I think there's, it, there's a lot of carryover to what we should be doing daily. And then just, you, you know, I think when he was talking, when Kevin was talking, it's, he very much reminds me of the beauty of what it is to be a child. Right. And to have each day, he, to have this wonder and awe of the universe of the person in front of you and the experience that we live in. And, and I think it just doesn't happen by chance, right? He's exercised that muscle that all of us can, right? All of us can continue to see the world for what it really is, the wonder that it is. And that's a, that's a challenge to me, right? In the midst of the busyness, are we waking up each day with the intention of, seeing our life, our relationships, our kids, our friendship, our community, our work as more as gifts, not just burdens that we have to burn through and complete and tasks we have to mark off because it very easily can turn into that. And, And so I think just maintaining that wonder and appreciation is really critical for, for just a, a well lived life, right? There's, there's no way to have, deep, meaningful, beautiful experiences without that, maintaining that spark of what it is to be a child and, and just the, the grace and empathy and joy that they jump out of bed with. And maybe that's the beauty of working in the world of art, you know, for the good ones is that they are able to keep that flame alive, whereas many of us don't. So. Yeah, if I could put it on a bumper sticker, I was reminded of a scene from Ted Lasso where he talks about curiosity over judgment. And it's this amazing scene where Rupert, the former owner of the team, challenges him to a darts match in a pub. Yeah. And basically puts the team on the line and he gives this whole speech while he's throwing darts. Ted Lasso does. And he's amazing at darts. And he talks about curiosity over judgment and that, you know, you judged me as some dumb football coach from middle America. And if you'd been curious, you would have asked some intriguing questions like, Ted, are you any good at darts? And he (laughs) throws the last one in the bullseye. But it's not that judgment doesn't exist, but I think it's curiosity over judgment. It's choosing curiosity and admitting judgment. Yeah, Uh, that's great. Well, Kevin, we've spent a lot of time with you here and we're, we're grateful for it. I hope I can visit you next time I'm out in the New Jersey, New York, Long Island area. Yeah. Uh, see your studio. That'd be great. I would, I'd love to have you. And yeah, I hope, I hope to overlap you guys. I know you got some trips planned and stuff like that. And then I have friends down in the Carolinas and it's really exciting, Sean, to hear about your recent venture. I'd love to get to see that. So yeah, yeah to see you guys in person would be fun. So I would, I would. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time, sir. I do. I do. Thank you, guys. Well, John, next time, show up with your mic. <laughs> but I'll do the outro because I do have a mic. Anyway, guys, we we do hope that you, as always, got a little bit something from someone else's story, right? The the there's there's a lot to learn 
today. And we hope that as you go into this week or the next, and as you're listening in your car or on a walk, that your life is ever growing in the experience of what it is to know and be known. And uh, so we thank you for listening. For John, for Kevin, this has been a Known Experience podcast. And we'll talk to you next time.